the victory is assured but the final battle only comes when the king returns he completes that which he begun in the meantime we're pressing forward taking ground so today I want to talk to you about taking your promised land I want to talk to you about getting that thing that God promised you that looks so far away right now about that scripture that became so real to you as a promise and yet your life just seems to be getting worse about that dream that God gave you of starting that new business or that new ministry or that blessing that's coming upon your family but yet you have not yet received it it's a promise but it, it, it hasn't come yet. It's still out there. It's still, you're still longing for the day when it becomes yours. Turn with me to Joshua chapter 1. I'm going to give you just a, uh, an introduction. In, in Deuteronomy, the end of the book of Deuteronomy, we see the end of Moses' life. Moses, the great prophet of God, said there had been nobody like him. Nobody that uh, did the miracles and the signs and wonders that Mo God used Moses to perform in Egypt to bring the people out. To bring them out. It was Moses' job to bring them out. But a generation had to die in the wilderness before Joshua gets to bring them in. Moses brought them out and his apprentice that sat under him for 40 years in the wilderness. It says of, of Joshua, when, 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 this, when God would visit Moses in his tent, Moses would then leave and Joshua would stay behind in the glory. His training. Was in the presence of God. Used, God used Moses to train him. But he also spent times of refreshing. In the presence of the Lord. I want to tell you something. You can learn more in five minutes in the glory. Than you can 15 hours studying and praying. Now that does not say we should not pray and we should not study. We should. But enlightenment comes in the presence of God. It all comes together and begins to make sense. Those things you prayed about, those things you studied in the word, you begin to get illumination in the presence of God because there's a spirit of prophecy. That's what I've been praying over this service today. That a spirit of prophecy would fall upon us. And you would receive a delivering word that will bring you into your prophetic promises. Moses gets to the border of the promised land. God brings him up on top of a mountain. And he can see it, but he doesn't get to go in. And it says, and, and Joshua was with him. And Moses laid hands on Joshua. And in the first chapter, chapter of Joshua, it says, And the Lord was with Joshua just like he was with Moses. There is this transference of spirit and a transference of authority. You know, my wife and I had long discussion last night. And uh, we're talking about authority. Lots of people are striving to get authority. They want it so much. I have always run from it. I've been a neglectant leader. 
I have not desired to be in the forefront. Never. I don't like it. I'd rather be in the background helping. And maybe God likes to find people who are reluctant. Moses was reluctant. Don't get me. Get my brother Aaron. He's smarter and he, he can really preach. But authority comes to those who assume their responsibility. When we first came here 36 years ago, God made me feel. Now, this is crazy. I know it sounds so crazy. I was such a novice. I didn't know anything. I don't know much now. Uh, after all these years, I'm a slow learner. People say, how did you do I have no idea. I don't know how it was done. Don't, I can't write a book about it. I have no clue. I just prayed and obeyed. God put this city on my heart. And when you, uh, when you receive that, when you accept it and carry it, then God gives you authority. He doesn't give you authority to rule. He gives you authority to be responsible. We want authority and then say, it's not my fault, it was his fault. <laughs> the old president in the United States, Harry S. Truman, had a sign on his desk, the buck stops here. In other words, there's command level responsibility. Even if you had nothing to do with it, if you're the leader, you still held responsible. You're held responsible for the things that people under you do. Even you weren't there. Even you didn't know it. You should have. Joshua was given the responsibility to bring them into the promised land. Therefore, as God was with Moses, so he was with Joshua. He had the responsibility and with that responsibility came the authority to lead. It wasn't an easy task. Moses failed for 40 years. Joshua 1 begins, uh, maybe I'll just read the, the first seven verses of Joshua 1. Actually, I'm going to be taking thoughts from the first five chapters, but it's too long to read. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. What news to get huh? on your first day of leadership. <laughs> your spiritual father is dead. Now, therefore, arise. He is down. Now you're going up. He's under the dirt now I'm telling you, arise. Go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. As I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates and all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea, that's the Mediterranean, towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to ye... For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it 
to the right hand or to the left. That you may prosper wherever you go. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We just pray, God, that you would be with us. That you would speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Joshua, number one, Joshua's commission. Joshua was commissioned, first of all, to take them from where they were to where God had a promise waiting for them. They had to move. Here you go with DeSarno's <laughs> saying, God's trying to get you to the right place at the right time doing the right thing. You are out of position, Israel. You're on the wrong side of this river. I've got to get you through the river to the other side where you belong. Your promise is not here. I've got to get you across. That's why years ago our youth group was named Crossover. It's from this text. Trying to get you to cross over. From the life of hoping to the life of receiving. And this journey is your trial of faith. It's what gets you from point A to where you need to be. You're commissioning, I'm commissioning you to get them. Now this is two million people. And how are you going to get them across a river? He had memories of Moses and the Red Sea. As I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. I, I used Moses and I took this group of people across a, 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 a more vast body of water than this one. That was a sea. This is only a river. It took some, you had to cross a sea to get out of Egypt. And that is prophetic of our conversion. Pharaoh is a, is a type of Satan. Crossing the Red Sea is a type of leaving the devil's kingdom. Now you're on the way to the kingdom of heaven. There's a process. You know, I, I don't mean to be controversial, but this way we, we preach the gospel is only partial. We're telling people the facts of the gospel, okay? God loves you so much. He sent Jesus to die on the cross so that you could be forgiven of your sins. Correct. Just pray this prayer. Say, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Come into my heart. And you will be assured of heaven. You don't have anything to worry about. Sometimes and sometimes no. Because it's not about a formula. It's about a relationship. It's not about heaven when you die, eternal life. Eternal life begins with the relationship. And if you are in proper relationship, when you cross the river of death, the relationship will continue through eternity. It's not like signing an agreement. It's like getting married. Till death do us part, only this time, there is no death. Okay? If that prayer leads you to a relationship, then I agree. But if you pray that prayer in a meeting, and your friend just forces you to go to the front, and the preacher just says, okay, now if you just repeat these words after me, you're going to heaven. Mm. Takes more than that, friend. Our Catholic friends are right. They say they make it too easy. That is too easy. There must be a changed life. You must enter from death into life. You got to be translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. There must, you got to get married to Jesus. You can't just pray the prayer and then go back to your old life and, and just be the same and never change. We, we lead people astray that way. 
Many times people are in a meeting like this and it, they get emotional. They feel the spirit of God and, and, and they make some kind of an emotional commitment that as soon as they walk out the door, they forgot all about it. That's like going on a date with Jesus. It was a nice evening out. And then you never talk to each other again. That's not eternal life. That's a brief encounter. Now that brief encounter is supposed to give you a motivation to pursue the relationship. And if you seek him with all your heart, you're going to find him. That, that brief encounter will lead you to an eternal relationship. But if that was just an emotional roller coaster, you just, and then, then I hope you have another encounter. Maybe it will take a series of encounters for you to make that final, and by the way, it's more than a commitment. It's more than, it's more than a decision. It's a life, not just a decision. A decision that requires follow-up action. You know, I, I've, been, I've been chairman of many boards uh, throughout my long ministry now. Sometimes a board of something will get together and they make all these decisions and they write it in the minutes and then everybody forgets about it and no, there's no action. That's nothing. That amounts to zero change. There's no change. That resolution must be followed up with affirmative action. We have to stop telling people it's just a matter of words. It's not just a matter of words. You can say those vows at the altar, but then the rest of your life you're supposed to live them. You can say till death do us part and two weeks after the marriage you get an annulment. You said the right words, you see, but you did not nurture the relationship. I want to get you, God says, past the hope to the fulfillment. In order to do so, you got to come. All right, you already came out of Egypt. You already, you know, in fact, you were born in the wilderness. This generation was born in the wilderness. You'll see the significance of that in just a moment. But I'm going to bring you not just to the place where God's taken care of you. Because they were well taken care of in the wilderness. But to the place of productivity. To the place where you begin to act like your father and be productive. From childhood to the place where you can reproduce. So number one, he had to get them across Jordan. Number two, his instruction was, and you're going to have to be strong to do this. Joshua, by the way, Joshua is the same word as Jesus. It means salvation. He's the man used to bring salvation to the nation. You're going to have to be strong because you must be a general, a commanding field general. And then you must be a nation builder. You're going to have to be strong. You have many obstacles because there's, there's many Nations, many tribes living in that land right now, and they think it belongs to them. Now you have the deed, you have the title God has given, but there's squatters in there that have been there for generations. They actually believe they own the land, but God is dispossessing them, He's evicting them, but they will not go without a fight. So Joshua, these people need a strong leader 
to lead the army and then to build the nation. And this nation will be a theocracy. It's God's laws that shall prevail. So, thirdly, I made mention of this already, you must drive out the inhabitants. You will be a leader of war. In order to understand this theology of the kingdom that this church has preached for more than three decades, you must understand this is about war. This is not just about your personal salvation. We, we are myopic. We can only see just this fire in front of our eyes. There's a bigger picture than that. Yes, it is about our personal salvation. And that, that was the great revelation of the reformer Martin Luther. That it was a personal savior. Jesus was a personal savior. But he is all of that and so much more. Because God is in a war. It's not just our personal salvation. He's taking back what was stolen from him. It's not all about us. It's really all about him. And you've got to understand that we are saved so that we can join the army of God and have a part in the salvation of planet earth. Why does, self, why does the planet need to be saved? Because it's under the evil empire. Okay. This is more understood in terms of Star Wars. The evil empire. Through the evil emperor. Through deceit. Has usurped. The legal authority and stolen what was another's inheritance. And he rules with wickedness and evil. And this whole plan of God, this whole Garden of Eden, this whole thing is designed to put down the rebellion that didn't start on planet earth. It started in heaven. When Satan, Lucifer, said, I will put my throne above the throne of the Most High God. That's what it's all about. You got to get that part. When you get that part, you begin to understand purpose. That's why we can say, God has a plan for your life. You are a person of purpose. Not just get saved today and wait to go to heaven. Which is what many Christians are like that. And I always joke, if that was true, when we baptize you, we just hold you under the water. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. And then you go straight to heaven. Why suffer all these years? Huh? If it's only die and then go to heaven, see, nah, bring it on. Huh. I found an old hippie song that we used to sing when we were brand new Christians from 1970. Going up to the spirit in the sky. Dun, 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 dun. Hey, very hippie with psychedelic guitar. <laughs> Going up to the spirit in the sky. If that's all there is, then Siggy, shoot me the day I get born again. Because it's much better up there than it is down here. But there is a plan, there is a purpose of God to retake this planet Earth. And you and I get to have a part in it. Now, this will not be completed by us. But we're supposed to be moving forward. Little by little, moving forward, taking ground. All the goodness that you see in this earth is a demonstration of the kingdom of heaven. The hospitals, 
Who started hospitals? Christians. Who started nursing? Florence Nightingale was a committed Christian. Who started uh, uh, a charitable organization? Uh, General Booth, the head of the Salvation Army. Orphanages, the same, Christians. Higher education in the USA, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Christian institutions before, not now. They're some of the battles we have lost. That's why we're supposed to be making a difference, friend. Because this world belongs to God. And I just lost my notes here. Hmm. Help me, Lord. Can't trust these things. Ah, there it is. There it is. Okay. All right. Drive out the inhabitants. In the Old Testament, the inheritance was a physical piece of property, what we call Israel. Not even, they don't even have it all now. But if you go by these, these uh, uh, description of the land from here, it's more than what Israel is occupying now. I have never really preached that much about Israel, but I want to tell you this. That land belongs to them, and God helped the people that tries to take it from them. Their inheritance has always been tied to the land. That land is theirs, no matter what the United Nations says, no matter what President Obama says, no matter what anybody in this world says, God gave the, the, the parameters of their inheritance, and it's theirs. Now, there may be other occupants there now. And you know what? They're the same ones that were there in the beginning. They're the, they're the relatives. He said, go get them out. Take them out. And they represent in the New Testament all the bad things in our life that needs to go. All the selfishness. You don't have to study how to be selfish. It just comes natural. The little baby is selfish. Mine. And they'll always say, you share, you share, darling. No. <laughs> you have to teach generosity. Why the first word of baby in English anyway, the first word they learn is no. <laughs> Not Yes. Maybe yes is harder to say. I don't know. No. Comes natural. And the working of the Holy Spirit in our life, the sanctifying process, is taking out all them Jebusites and Philistines that's in our heart. Get them out or you'll never get the promise. They are hindering us. And they break down the hedge of protection around our life. And it is a growth process. It took them many, 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 many years to get those inhabitants out. In fact, they never got them all out. And probably we're never going to get them all out. But we're supposed to be working on it. And God, it's called growth. It could, be, it could begin in our lives with a massive act of deliverance. And then it's hina hina. Yes, a crisis that brings a deliverance from, let, let's say you're a homosexual or a, a, you're sexually perverted, and you get this big deliverance in your life, and that goes away, but you still lie. You're still greedy. Uh, many things to work on in our lives throughout our Christian life. And you think you deal with it once and it's gone, and then five years later the thing tries to come back again. Got to deal with it again. 
How long? Forever until you go to be with Jesus. Hopefully, we get the big stuff, you know, taken care of. And it doesn't come back. But, you know, who are we to classify what's big and what's not big? I classify myself, I'm easy on myself. All those things that are gone, I consider the big. And the things that's still there, I hope they're the small. You got to drive them out, God said. Get rid of them, drive them out. It's going to be a part of your commission. Okay, Joshua's commission. Bring them across. Be strong. Be a military leader and a nation builder. Drive out the inhabitants and then take possession. Take it. It's yours. And when you take possession, that means you got to work it. You know how sometimes a government, I remember uh, the Philippines years ago gave away land in Mindanao if anybody wanted to go there, but you must make improvements. In other words, you had to sow, you had to plant, you had to make it productive. You must take possession, and then you, that causes you to have to work. In the wilderness, they didn't work. They woke up every morning. The food was laying on the ground. They just picked it up. They didn't work. They just walked. Endlessly. Purposelessly. It was about trying to stay saved. They, were, they, were, they belonged to God. They were following God. But they had no fruit of their own. They just were trying to stay alive. And there is a season in our lives when we need that. But we need to, not eternally. Yeah, we got to pass from Egypt to Canaan. But it was only like a two-week journey, and it took them 40 years, and, and a whole generation never made it. Because of their unbelief and doubt. Secondly, God gives instructions for possessing your inheritance, entering your inheritance. Number one, he said, the priests are going to get ready. Get ready. We're moving out. We're going across Jordan. And this is what I want you to do. Number one, keep your eyes on the ark. They had the ark of the covenant. It was built in the wilderness. Moses got the pattern on top of Mount Sinai. It was symbolic of the throne of God on earth. It's the presence of God on earth. It's Christ in you, your hope of glory. It's from glory to glory. He's changing you even into the, pre even into the image of the Lord. Keep your eyes on the ark. The priest shall carry it on their shoulders. Okay, in the New Testament, you and I are known as a kingdom of priests. All of us. We're all priests. We're a kingdom of priests. One translation says kings and priests. And our purpose is to show the glory of God on earth that men everywhere might fear the Lord. They might know that God is God. Why? Because we carry the church, the, the kingdom of priests carries the ark on their shoulder. They carry the presence. That's our witness. Our witness is not a canned speech that you, re, you memorize so that when you see an unbelieving friend, you say, these are the four spiritual laws, blah, 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 blah. You carry the glory. The ark is on your shoulders. They cannot see Christ except you bring him. When the priests stand and carry the ark, follow the ark. I want to tell you, if I was not in the ministry, if I was sitting there where you're sitting, 
I would choose a church by where the presence of God is felt. I would follow the ark. And if the glory departs, I would also depart. I would go where it is. I am faithful to the presence of God, not to men. Men will fail you. Why? Because we're all human. God will never fail you. They followed the ark. Number one, keep your eyes on the ark, follow the ark. Number two, sanctify yourself. Set yourself apart. Know that you are special. Know that you are different. We are different from the people in the world. Not so much that we're better than them, but that God has separated us as a, as a, as a special people, as, as, a, as, a, as a peculiar people, the old King James says. We're different. Why? Because God has marked us with his spirit and said, set them over here. Their purpose is for me. separated. It's like he called them out out of the dragnet, the parable of the dragnet. I separated them unto myself. They belong to me. They're a special people. Israel always believed there was all the nations and then there was Israel. Why? Because God set them apart. And I want you to know that's our uniqueness. It's not that we're better than everybody else. It's that when you come into the kingdom, you're in another realm. You know, we talk about this. I pray that somehow I can communicate uh, the ability to you to, to live your life with a biblical worldview. You know, we, we've been watching these, uh, Political debates in America. Grabe. And the Lord spoke to me. You know, I had my favorite candidate, da 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 da. He's not doing so good. The one I don't like is beating everybody. He's from New York and I know his kind. I used to be one. Sarcastic, know it all, selfish, humble guerro. I, me, my. And then God told me, get your eyes off those people. Didn't I tell you this is a season of if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, then I'm going to come and heal their land. You think some politician is going to come and make the Philippines great? I got news for you. Only the visitation of God will change the fate of a nation. Now, he may in his visitation set men in places to bring this about, but it's not by the mere will of man. Maybe God doesn't want to make us great now. Maybe he's not done humbling us. Maybe he wants us to stay in Babylon another 50 years. You see, God's ways are not our ways. Who says America is going to be the greatest nation forever? They're not acting very great. Killing the babies and uh, same-sex marriage, all this crazy foolishness. And then you think the blessing of God's going to come on you? You know what's coming? The wrath. The redemptive love of God that will bring you down. So you're in there with the prodigal son fighting with the pigs to survive. Why? Because he wants to get you out of there and get you back to your inheritance. And sometimes that's the only way you'll listen. I don't think it has to be, but many of us is very stubborn. Thirdly, I want you, he said, listen to the word. There's going to be a word that goes, you got to obey that word. If you're ever going to get your inheritance, you got to be a person of the word. Because that's where the promises are. That's where God tells us how, why, when, where, and what. 
got to pay attention to the Word of God, not just the preached Word. you got to have a Bible in your house that's underlined and marked and noted and, and read and meditated on, and you do it on your knees praying, God, help me to be obedient to your Word. And, th- and fourthly, you have to remember your miracles. Remember what Moses did in Egypt. And as I was with Moses, so I'm going to be with you. Remember the miracles that God has done. You know, it should be a resounding cry of war. My God can do anything. I remember when God did this for me. And if he did that then, why, what will stop him from giving me a miracle now? Whew. Remember the delivering power of God. Thirdly, once you get over to Jordan, there must be a renewal of covenant for a new generation. You can't, you're not ready to go to war yet. You must be circumcised. Because all of these men were born in the wilderness. They were never circumcised. There was never a cutting away of the flesh. They were just concerned about the flesh needs. What to eat. Wear, wear, wear shoes on your feet. Sail in the mall, you know. 15 and 30. Why? I can't understand. How come every 15 and 30 there's always a sale? Do you get it? Don't you pay your tithes over there in that mall. Don't let Gaisano get your tithes or your offerings or your alms. must be a cutting away of the flesh which brings a sensitivity to the spirit. God's not trying to take your fun away. He's trying to take away that, those things that numb you. The anesthetic that makes you dull so that you cannot receive spiritual things. Hey, you're out there in the disco to 3 o'clock in the morning drinking margaritas all night. Come to church on Sunday and think everything's going to be good. Probably you're hungover. Now, I don't mean to get legalistic. You know, I, I don't do that from this pulpit. We're not preaching a list of do's and don'ts. But you need to cut off everything that desensitizes you from the things of God. You ask yourself, is this, everybody come to me and say, Pastor, in our church, is this a sin? Well, here's the answer. Write it down so you never have to ask me. Can you find it in the kingdom of heaven? On earth, we pray, on earth as it is in heaven, right? If it's in heaven, you're allowed here. There's no abortion in heaven. Can't find any. There's no murder. There's no stealing. If it's done in heaven, you can do it here on earth. If it's not done in heaven, then don't do it here. Because we're praying on earth as it is in heaven. Now, not to put everybody under condemnation. None of us has perfected this yet. But we're desiring we're pressing. That's, our, that's what we want. God, I don't want anything in my life that doesn't please you. Huh? When that's your desire, you're going to get it. I remember when we first got saved, my pastor asked my wife, what is it that you desire in the kingdom? And she said, I want love. He said, that's what you'll have. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, you shall have them. Second, the second ordinance, first one was circumcision. In the New Testament, that's baptism. 
I hope everybody here has been baptized in water since you've been born again. I'm not going to tell you you can't go to heaven if you're not baptized. Because somebody will say, what about the thief on the cross? He's, he was not baptized and Jesus said, today you'll be with me in my kingdom. Well, if you're nailed to a cross, you're excused. <laughs> you don't need to. No need. But if you're not nailed to a cross, Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Every one of you. Except if you're nailed on a cross. Your excuse. If you have not yet been baptized in water since you repented, since you've been born again, see Pastor Michael. Where are you, Michael? Wave at him. Let him see your handsome self. You're hiding over there. There he is. You see him, and we will make a schedule for your baptism. Secondly is Passover. They had not celebrated the Passover in the wilderness. Okay, in the New Testament, Passover is our communion. And communion is the time when we remember our deliverance. A time of reflection. Do this often in remembrance of me. We remember the strong hand of God. That brought us out of darkness into the, in, into the light. They celebrated their Passover. Now, in conclusion. They were not allowed to fight until they got healed from their circumcision. Okay. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. I want to tell you, breaking old habits is painful. Mm, special. There are too many amens coming from over there. <laughs> we have these habits, you know, that are not good. They're harmful. But to break it, suck it, Gaio. Cutting away of the flesh. We think, and I'll tell you, it's in the head. We're still thinking like a carnal man. Natural man. Flesh, it's not just sexual sins. It just means you're not thinking spiritually. You're thinking physically all the time. You're not equipped to fight these spiritual battles while you're still thinking like a physical man. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. We, he who is carnally minded cannot receive the things of God. For the carnal mind is opposed to God. You go to somebody, you pray for them, you say, I heard you've been sick, what's wrong? Well, the doctor says, I have stage 3 cancer. Come on, God can heal you. Let's just pray. Oh, no, well, the doctor said it's too late. <laughs> Which way are you thinking? Now, it's true. What you said was true in the flesh. But the spirit is higher than the flesh. There is a parallel truth that says, by his stripes, you were healed. It doesn't say that cancer is curable. It says God's mightier than the incurable disease. Cancer is, you know, a deadly thing. That's not to make light of it. And I'm not saying everybody we pray for gets healed. But I'm saying, put on a spiritual paradigm. Hey, what do you got to lose? Give it a try. Huh? Give it a try. 
I mean, you can't heal them. It's by the stripes of Jesus. But it says we are to anoint the sick with oil. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise them up. Why not try? Hey, they're going to die anyway. Can't, you can't get any worse than that. Just maybe, huh? Remember your miracles. They will encourage you not to think in the flesh. Because naturally our response is just natural. It takes study and prayer and pressing in to break those old flesh habits. But you will never win victories as long as the flesh is intact. Because the flesh will try to rule over the spirit. It's logical. And it's a truth. But God's got a higher truth. All right. Once they go over and they go begin to get their inheritance, there's good news and there's bad news. We'll get the bad news first. The manna ceases. No more every morning you wake up, look outside, and there's all the food you need for the day. Now you have been given a piece of ground. But the first year, you will eat out of the crops that the Philistines sowed. Okay, you didn't have to plant the first crop. When you took the land, it was already there, so it gives you time. But after the first crop is gone, as a man sows, so shall he reap. In the wilderness, manna. Manna will sustain you, but sowing and reaping will prosper you. Ooh. Manna sustains you, but it keeps you down. You can only get to this level. And, and, and the instructions were, don't try to keep two days worth. It'll spoil day by day existence. But in the promised land, you can plant your entire ground and get more than what you need. Prosperity is getting, having more than what you need to sustain yourself. Why? So that you have something to give to someone who's in need. They, pr they crossed over. But it requires labor. You got to cut the flesh away and you have to heal from it before you can war and before you can work. Mm. Before you can war and before you can work, you must be healed. Help me, Jesus. I lose battles. Why? Because I go back to the flesh. I'm not prospering. Why? Because I'm satisfied with daily sustenance. I only sow enough to survive. If you want to reap more, sow every field you have. Don't just sow a little garden out in front of the house. You see, they receive big plots of land. But you have to clear it. You have to remove the stones. You have to plow it. You have to cultivate it. You have to get it ready. And you have to sow it. It takes hard work. And you have to invest. No more free ride. No more. No more Jesus will fix it for you. Maybe if you sow. He who sows sparingly reaps sparingly. He who sows bountifully reaps bountifully. God gave you the land. What will you do with it? Repent of your small thinking. 
I have a little house. I buy cigarettes one at a time. My toothpaste is just this small little sachet. Hey, come on. You're a child of the king. Mm -mm. Repent of your small thinking. We got a big God. And he desires for you to be blessed. He gets no joy from our defeat. Wants us to walk in victory. So I want to pray for you today. I want to pray you're coming out of your wilderness day by day sustenance. I pray today that God will fill, change all of you to multimillionaires. And we'll preach this gospel to the nations. We'll feed the hungry. We'll get five ranchos going. Instead of four or five big givers in the church, you'll all be big givers. Why? Because you sowed your whole field. Knowing God is not mocked. If it works for this person, if you do the same in faith, it'll work also for you because God's not a respecter of persons. Uh, you're American. They used to tell me when I started this church, oh, you're growing because Americans has Bose sound system. I did not. I went out and bought piezo mics. It was horrible. Because I didn't want them to say, it's bec I mean, I had the sound system was this big. No, it doesn't matter what color you are. Doesn't matter if you're tall, short, fat, skinny. It makes no difference. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is in you. And God's trying to work what's in to come out. If it's demons, he's trying to work them out. If it's a kingdom of heaven, he's trying to work it out of you. Demonstrate it. Don't hide it. Don't hide your light under a basket. So I want to pray. Oh, bless them, Lord. Let them know who they are, Lord. Don't let the devil identify them. They are your children, the sons and daughters of God. No more orphans, God. Children. We are the offspring of God. Born into the family of God. Oh. We have the down payment of our inheritance. We thank you for it. Help us to act like it. Act it out. Help us to act it out. Help us to act it out. Not just talk it, but act like it. We're made in your image, Lord. You've put your dignity upon us. Shaba. Children of a king. Help us, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. I just pray the blessing of God over this house. I want to tell you, there's greatness here. There is greatness here. Not because you're well-educated, not because you're intellectual, but because the Spirit of God dwells in you. You don't have to know anything. He knows everything. He'll tell you if you listen. You don't have to be creative. We serve the creator. He got all the creativity. Oh, it'll flow through you, but doesn't originate with you. You're a vessel. He wants to pour to you and through you. I remember this young lady was in my house. She was wanting prayer for deliverance. We prayed for her. I told her this, river in, river out. River in, river out. Spirit in, spirit out. If you get a hold of that, if you get a hold of that, 
It doesn't matter where you went to school. It doesn't matter what your grades were. Until I got to college, I was just barely average. Well, I didn't care. I was just trying to get by. I was doing the manna thing. Didn't want to fail, but I wasn't going to work too hard to excel until I got the Holy Ghost. And then I was magna cum laude. That's the difference. Hmm. Shaba. Lord, fill us with your spirit this morning. Signs, wonders, and miracles. So the world might know who you are. Prosper us that the world might know you are Jehovah Jireh. Shay. Use us. Acts of kindness and mercy. So that people will know we serve a compassionate and a loving God. Thank you, God. Jesus. While I was sitting there in pastor's preaching today, the Lord gave me this word. I see pages turning in many of your lives right now. And how you receive this, you're open to what pastor's talk, talking about today. These pages are turning in your life. And you're going to see great things happen if you will listen to the word of God today. These things will change. You're right on the brink of things happening in your life. And I just seen so many pages turning. And after that happens, you're walking into a new day, a new season. God is going to bring you through. Allow the Lord. Allow the Lord. Allow the Lord. Listen. Allow. 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 Don't hinder. Allow. Allow. He's going to bring you through. God is good. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you, God. Don't let the devil steal this seed from you. It'll change your life. So, Lord, I pray for this house. I pray for these, your children. They are your lovely ones, Lord. Ha ha. You have separated them unto yourself. They are yours. I pray that they would receive the word in good ground. They would apply it. They would change their mind. Change their mind and see themselves the way you see them. I speak words of blessing over their lives. Ha, productivity, prosperity, Shabbat, usefulness, agents of change. Oh, seeds of blessing. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.